There are pieces of media that have a lasting impact in culture, they manage to shape the future of their genre. For racing video games, this piece arrived with Gran Turismo, considered to be a niche title by their publisher and developers, as the arcade racers dominated the industry. Contrary to expectations, it took the world by storm when it released in December 1997 for the Japanese market, and May 1998 for us Westerners, becoming the PS1's bestseller and its sequel not far off. From then on, GT has become one of Sony's strongest franchises, and sure, all of this has its merit. However, its real impact can be seen outside this media, in car culture, and there's a few reasons for it. Already from the get-go, GT does things differently than its peers. It doesn't feature the traditional exotic supercars, which define the arcade racing genre, instead replaced by brands such as Nissan. Honda, Mazda and Toyota, these choices happen to be one of GT's most influential traits, as Japanese cars were held by many as reliable commuters, rather than sports cars, not by lack of merit though. By now Japanese cars were serious performers, cars that might be familiar like Civics and Accords share dealerships with an NSX, a Micra next to a GTR. It challenged the preconceived image we had of each brand, as most of their cars were very rare or non-existing for Western audiences. You could spend hours looking through each dealership and reading through each car's spec sheet and information, shining a light over cars you never seen before. I still remember the time me and my dad came across a bright red 3000 GT. We were in shock. We only knew what it was thanks to Gran Turismo. It was a gateway into Japanese sports cars for an entire generation, who saw the real potential that they were able to rival the established European brands, and for a new generation, the poster car wasn't a Ferrari or a Lamborghini but a GTR or Supra, and sure, introducing these legends to a bigger audience is commendable, but it's another flavor of the Sodics, not too different from other titles of its time. However, GT was the first game with a massive car roster, if anything, it started this trend. Not only the greatest cars from each brand were featured, but unremarkable cars were part of their lineup, and even some of their failures. Today it's easy to say the first game was limited on choices, but it will be the second game, which released in 1999, which settled GT as the massive car encyclopedia we know it as today, with an unrivaled selection of vehicles. Exotics from all over the world, with brands such as Vector, Venturi, Roof and Lister, almost every European and American mainstream manufacturer, and of course, the Japanese. With so many vehicles, not all of them were desirable sports cars and the like, there was room for mundane commuters. I am willing to bet money that people from all over the the globe will find a car that is on the street and race. I'm probably arguing which country makes the worst cars. <laughs> I know which one I pick. <laughs> ah. There's a sense of morbid curiosity on how far they can go, or what kind of opponents they can beat. Humiliating sports cars with a total shitbox is a delight that cannot be described, and thus another staple of GT was born. The idea of racing any car to victory, it didn't matter if it was the fastest car in the world, or your dad's focus, or a tiny K car you never seen before, because these cars could be modified. All of them, all sorts of performance upgrades to increase their power, reduce their weight, replace stock tires with racing slicks, and so on. Cars are unlimited by their stock performance, but by their fully upgraded performance. If you are wondering how we discovered things like 1000 horsepower Supras and GTRs, it was in Gran Turismo. Each car was a mystery box, and you didn't buy them for their stock stats, but their potential for modifications. Certain cars could be tuned into fully fleshed race cars straight out of the dealership, and then these cars could be fine-tuned, with suspension adjustment, brake balance, gearing, and even differentials. GT introduced this aspect of car setups that today we take for granted in most games. And sure, all of this is great stuff, but it wouldn't mean a thing if their cars were terrible to drive. The downfall of many racing games have been their bizarre handling physics, and when GT released, most games were focused on ease of access and sense of speed rather than realism. It was bold to release a game with a subtitle like The Real Driving Simulator, where realistic mechanics were the core of it, and dare I say risky. GT's approach was simple enough, grab the realistic concepts that shaped driving and racing 
and make them accessible enough to play with a controller, but in concepts such as understeer or oversteer, where the loss of grip is natural rather than sudden, giving players a hint of their mistakes when they do occur. While cars might handle well, they can't be thrown around in each track in hopes that they might grip. Braking and accurate lines are vital in order to achieve good times and consistency, and the cars themselves are well represented. Their handling is different depending on their drivetrain, meaning they are accurate to their real counterparts to an extent. Weight and size matters as well, as weight transfer is represented. It's a game that manages to blend realistic driving concepts without the need of a steering wheel setup to play, making it approachable from the get-go, with a steep ladder to climb in exchange. But sure, it's not like GT is free of shortcomings. The first game's handling model was a bit unpredictable at times, at least on the braking. It boils down to the controllers, if you ask me, as it seems they try to replicate brake locking, which doesn't seem to work when your buttons are a simple on-off switch. Also, as a fun curiosity about the first GT game, it featured an arcade mode with tweaked physics, where cars have more grip and higher acceleration. Being similar to more arcade titles of the time, it wouldn't look out of place in the shelves, and we probably remember GT as a fun curiosity if it was all it offered, but its career mode, also known as simulation or GT mode, was the true game changer. The player starts with enough cash to buy a first car, which is usually quick enough to get in trouble, with a very limited selection of races to enter. The thing is, you don't really progress by doing races. And here lies one of GT's most controversial features. In order to unlock more races, you need a license, and these are divided by different levels, each one harder than the previous. You see, these licenses serve as a driving school, from learning to mark braking points and racing lines, and then placing the player on certain sections of track so they can put their technique to the test. By the end, you should be able to handle a race car. But Yellowbird, you provider of nostalgic dramas, I hear you ask. I can learn all of these things in races, why should I waste my time with licenses? They only exist to stall progression. Well, dear viewer, I invite you to think about each race that you are in. It's a tense scenario with multiple situations to focus, either defending, keeping your car in the track, and even tire management in some races. You are pulling all of your resources just to stay in the track and win. This isn't a friendly environment to learn habits and technique. Having a separate space to practice these techniques without having to juggle the different challenges of racing is useful. It's probably the most realistic aspect of GT, and we all missed the point. We hated doing these tests as kids, when in reality, they were the most important thing in the entire game. It's even more insane when you realize that this entire program was put in the hands of kids who wouldn't be able to get behind the wheel for at least 8 years or more. I admit they are frustrating, yes, but they don't deserve the bad reputation they get, which is often influenced by childhood nostalgia that some people have with them. Don't worry, dear reviewer, we all got my broken by A4 and other countless tests. I also struggled with them way back. They weren't the only one who screamed so much at their TV that their parents were seriously concerned. Uh, oh wait, maybe that's just me. But today I have to say that I have learned to drive around the track thanks to the licenses. The techniques taught by this test have been engraved in our minds and they were refined over years of practice. I invite you to revisit those tests that drove you insane. See how many tries they take now, you'll be surprised. That's why GT is so important. It offers a blueprint for players to step into this world of racing, at a time where nothing else came close regarding physics. But again, it was a video game. It managed to be entertaining and rewarding for those who persevere through its many challenges, creating an almost perfect environment to understand the basics of driving cars, helping to shape the skill set that if they desire, they can bring to other titles as well. With its endless car selection, it had something for everyone, at least making them curious on these machines. For some, it was even better as they had an interest in cars which GT only expanded, introducing them to many many cars that they haven't seen before, and kickstarting the interest on JDM cars. With all of this put together, GT has managed to play a vital role in the formation of car enthusiasts, 
and now we have seen the results, as they have grown and some have even made a successful career out of their passion with cars. Most of us here can say that we wouldn't have the same interest in cars if it wasn't for this franchise, and now you know why. You can send this video each time someone asks why Gran Turismo is so revered by car enthusiasts. And with that said, it's time for us to wrap this up, look after yourself, until next time.